I'm going to talk to you this morning about a topic that is that has been wrestled with for centuries in the body of Christ. And I think it's important because how many of you have been witnessing to people or sharing and they the ungodly have thrown at you questions that you felt like you couldn't answer. Has that ever happened to you? Recently, I was talking and listening to someone, and they, they went on the attack, ungodly person. And one of the questions that you will face is this. So what is evil? What is evil? How many of you understand that there's a movement today that there's no such thing as evil? It's a figment of the imagination. And then a second question, and quite frankly, this question is one of the most vicious and commonly used attacks against Christianity, and you'll see why when we get into this. Where did evil come from? And we're going to look at why that's such a difficult question to answer. I'm going to ask you to really think today. You know, like I said a couple weeks ago, the Bible says the Scripture was given for doctrine. We're going to talk about doctrine today. The doctrine of what is evil and where did it come from. To use a presidential term, it all depends on what the meaning of is is. What is evil? <laughs> the question is whether evil really is at all. How many of you know the Bible calls evil the mystery of iniquity? And by the way, I've, I've done my research and I've read some of the and listened to some of the best theologians probably in the last 50 years or 100 years, and many of the things I'm saying are fully supported by names that I don't use because there are men who are wonderful teachers who they teach some things I simply can't agree with, and so I don't use their names, but when I, I can't agree, I appreciate that there's those kind of men available. But the next statements, I'm going to make a few of them, are quotes from one of the most renowned Bible teachers probably in the last 50 years. He said, evil isn't. It is not. Evil is nothing. He said, this statement is not Christian science where they consider all evil nothing but illusion. Evil is no thing. I'm going to explain what I mean by this. I hope I have your attention by now. It's, a pre, it's got a negative prefix, no thing, nothing. Let me correct something that this culture is teaching. And I think it's been promoted by movies, especially the movie the movies called Star Wars. In the Star Wars movies, there is the good guys, and what do they call them? Jedi, the good guys are the Jedi. And the bad guys are called the... Huh? The Force, right? Huh? They're not the Force? The dark side. Oh, oh, right. The force is the good side. And <laughs> you can tell I don't watch movies. <laughs> but in that movie, they, they depict that there is this force, whether that's what they call it or not in the movie. There's this force that is evil. And it has a mind of its own. It has direction. And it has people who are are literally 
tapping into this unseen force. Is that a correct evaluation of Star Wars? The dark side. They tap into the dark side. They tap into this power of the dark side. Can I say it that way? Okay. <laughs> Evil is not a thing that has existence. It has no being. Now that's a quote from one of these theologians. Evil is actions that are the opposite of good actions. Evil is an activity performed by persons. It's not some force that goes through the earth that we can't resist. Evil is simply people or persons, depending on angels or men, choosing to walk a path that is not consistent with God. Historically, great theologians and philosophers of the Christian faith used two words, and I don't know Latin, so I'm not going to use the Latin words that they used, um, to translate and, and communicate what evil is. And in English, the two words are translated privation and negation. And they say that these two words define evil. Now, negation is used and talks about what something is not. How many of you know that so often to understand something, you've got to understand what it is not, right? For an example, let me say this. God is infinite. You know what that means? He is not finite. So if I say God is not finite, the opposite is clearly true. He's infinite. Evil can only be understood with the backdrop of good. If there is no good, we don't know what evil is. When God reveals what good is, we then know what evil is, because he revealed what good is. Examples are these, the, negative, the negation, the negative prefix. Evil is ungodliness. All right, are you following me so far? Evil is unrighteousness. Evil is injustice or unjustness. And evil, one man said it this way, is like a parasite. It can only be understood in the backdrop of good. And if the host of goodness dies, evil dies with it. We only learn evil from what is good. That was the negation side. The privation side is a lack or a deficiency. And that doesn't mean that you don't get what you want. It means you don't get what you need. It is evil that there are people starving to death on the earth. In the last three days, bus accident in Canada killed 15 people. 16 to 20 year old hockey players and their coaches. Yesterday, a guy ran a van into a crowd of people in Germany and killed two and injured 20. In Syria last night, they set off gas, toxic gas, and they believe up to 80,000 people died from the gassing, many of them children in diapers. There was an earthquake in 526 BC or AD in Antioch. The death toll was 250,000. In 1556, there was an earthquake that killed 830 
thousand people. In 1839 in India, there was a cyclone that killed 300,000 people. In 1920, there was a geological survey done, and there was an earthquake measuring 7.8, and an estimated 273,000 people died. In 1931, there was a flood in central China, and it affected 770,000 square miles from rain and melting snow, and somewhere between 2 and 3.7 million people died because of that flood in 1931. How many of you have ever heard of any of these things? See, those are evil. That's evil at functioning. It's a function. It's something that happens. It isn't a force. Now, the question I want to talk this morning about, what is sin? Here's a problem that the world is facing right now. Because of evolution and science and false teachers, The evolutionists teach, and your children are getting fed this from the time they're kindergartners on up, that the universe is simply a closed element, a closed environment. And there is no influence outside of just happenstance and evolution. And the earth evolved in the middle of this. And in this particular theory, the universe does not have God in it. There is no God, which is a common belief among evolution. In fact, that smart guy that just died has the chance to meet God for the first time, even though he denied he existed. But um, his big issue is there is no God. No such thing as a God. And if there is no God, who decides what is right and wrong? Who on this little blue earth of ours decides what's right and wrong? What is sin? What isn't sin? What is evil? How many of you understand that ISIS believes killing innocent people is right? That it's noble? That it's godly. That's what they believe. They believe they're doing God a service to put people to death, to burn people alive. They think that's God's will for them to exercise their religion. You see, if, if there is no God, then what we end up doing is everybody does what is right in their own eyes. And what is evil to you may not be evil to me. The thief doesn't think he's being evil. He's just meeting his needs. It's funny, people who don't believe that evil, there is such a thing as evil. And when I say a thing, a fun, the evil is a function. Evil is an action. And they don't believe there's evil actions. Just steal their wallet and see how fast they think it's an evil action. They, they call the police... That guy was evil. He stole my wallet. But then you have the universe, and same with the earth in it, and you have the God of heaven, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they exercise influence on the earth, and they decide what is good or what is evil. And God reveals it, and we have the book of Romans that tells us something about God. You should be at least familiar with this scripture that you can turn to it. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, it says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be, may be known of God, isn't that an amazing statement? What may be known of God 
is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. There will not be a single man stand before the judgment seat of God with any excuse that will hold water. Because God made it known to them that he's there and that he's the almighty God. Now, sin or moral evil is simply lacking conformity to God's commands and God's standards of righteousness. Evil is not an independent force, it's not an illusion, but it is real and its effects are devastating. Persons commit acts that are evil in nature, and therefore it causes much harm, damage, chaos, suffering, and pain though, that are, for those who are affected by it. Please hold with me while we get through this difficult part. But where does evil come from? That's a difficult question. And why, why is it difficult? Listen to this question. How does evil intrude into a universe created by a God who is altogether holy, altogether righteous, and governs the universe he has made and rules over it? Have you ever considered that before? Do you know the church has been wrestling with this issue for centuries, well, millenniums? How does evil intrude into a universe created by a God who is altogether holy, altogether righteous, and governs the universe he has made and rules over it? And one of the questions I've been asked repeatedly, how can God, if there's a God and he's good and he's perfect and he's all powerful, why does he tolerate evil? Why doesn't he put it to an end? The question is asked by the ungodly. If God is almighty and holy and abundantly good, why doesn't he stop the evil actions from being committed? Critics of Christianity declare this, that this issue is the most vulnerable part of Christianity. And they are probably right because we don't give decent answers. They charge the very existence of evil makes the existence of God problematic because we say God is omnipotent and that he is loving and good and yet these two attributes can't coexist. That's what they say. Did you understand what I just said? The very existence of evil makes the existence of God problematic because we say God is omnipotent and that he is loving and good, and yet these two attributes can't coexist. If God has the power to do good and doesn't stop evil, then he can't be good. Have you ever been confronted with questions like this? The argument is made, either God is not good or he's not all-powerful. Because if he's all good and all-powerful, then he should be stopping evil. Do you understand that simple question? And we know, according to the word of God, that God is both all-powerful and infinitely good. And he does not approve evil. And frankly, he does not intend to allow it to go on forever and forever. However, the Heavenly Father allows evil to continue for his own reasons. And I'm going to try to address that dilemma this morning. I'm going to try to seek to provide an answer to this question of where evil comes from, from my perspective based upon the authority of scriptures. It is somewhat simplistic to attribute the entrance of evil through the choices of Satan and Adam's free will. Oh, they just had a free will. The question there has to be answered. Why did either of them make the choice they made? 
one major theologian says that if, if Adam and Eve made these choices, there had to be an evil inclination in them to make the choice. And if they were created by God, then God had to create the evil inclination. So they attack Christianity on that basis. Do you understand why this is a difficult answer, question to answer? This is not some easy solution. The answer that it was free will is rejected by many theologians because before a choice can be made, that moral inclination to make the bad choice had to be within them, and they don't accept that. I've said many times, and recently in fact, Adam was innocent, but he wasn't holy. There's a big difference between innocence and holy. Innocence means I haven't cre- done anything wrong. Holy means I have been given the opportunity to do what is wrong and chose to only do what was right. Do you understand that? I can be innocent. Little kids are off, they're innocent until you tell them don't touch their stereo and they go over and break the knobs off. But they grow up to be good and obedient as if they listen to what they're told to do. I have two little dogs that I really like. And most of the time, they're, they're innocent little loving balls of fur. But the other day I went in and one of my dogs got a hold of my nice chair and chewed a hole in the arm. I had to exercise grace and mercy and recognize things don't matter. People matter, and so do dogs. <laughs> Listen to this statement. For God to have a man in his image He had to allow the man to be tested. He had to allow it. The opportunity to disobey was necessary, or he would have never had a man in his image because there would have been no chance for the man to ever disobey. We would have been robots. But God doesn't want robots. He wants lovers. He wants men and women who love him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength who he, who he can marry at this marriage supper of the Lamb. When Adam was told by God, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. When that command came forth, God created the possibility of an evil action when he gave Adam that prohibition. Had he not given him the prohibition, there would have been no evil action available. Is that clear? It's like you say, don't do that. The moment you say, don't touch that, don't eat that, don't go there, you have created a prohibition that creates disobedience or obedience on the part of the one you're giving the command to. And when God said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he created the potential for evil. The question is, why did Adam eat it? Was there an evil inclination created in him by God, or was there something else that caused Adam to eat that tree? That's what I'm going to try to show you. I want you to notice, and this is all in Genesis chapter 2, and you can read this for yourself. That when God told Adam not to eat that tree, Eve had not yet even been created. Have you ever noticed that before? She wasn't there. She was created after God gave the prohibition. The very next thing. God said, oh, it's not good that man be alone. So he created a helper for him. Brought him to him. And... The Bible says she is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. And 1 Corinthians 11 tells us something about the women. In many, in this society, the liberation movement of the women's lib movement, they reject this categorically flat out. 
For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. In other words, Adam was created first, and God took the rib of Adam and made woman. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Tell that to a lib and see how much they like that. But this is the word of God. It doesn't matter what the society and the culture says. For this cause, because the woman was created for man, listen to what 1 Corinthians 11.10 says. Ladies, hear this. For your sake, hear this. Paul said, for this cause, because the woman was created for man, for this cause ought the woman to have power, and that word power is the Greek for authority, on her head because of the angels. Now, what does a woman have to fear from God's angels? Nothing. As we will see in another scripture in a little bit, they are ministering spirits sent to minister to the heirs of salvation. If you're a Christian woman, the angels of God are there to help you and serve you and minister to you. The angels you need to fear, not fear, but need to be aware of and be wary of and pray that you be delivered from are satanic angels. And when a woman decides she doesn't need authority on her head and she doesn't need anybody over her, she opens herself up to demonic angels and look at the fruit of women's lib. This last week, Two lesbians were married, and they adopted six children. They got $270,000 of federal support or state support from the government, and one of them just gunned their car and drove it over a 100-foot cliff into the ocean below, and everybody in the car, the, the couple the lesbian couple, and the six children were all killed. They just found one of the children. The th three of the children were found dead in the car. Three of them were missing. One just showed up on the shoreline today. There's two more somewhere still floating around in the ocean or maybe possibly eaten by fish. If you look at what happened to the women in the culture that we're living in in my lifetime that I have watched happen, when women's lib came in in the, 50, or the 60s and early 70s, all of a sudden, demonic activity among women has hit. And they are deceived, and they don't even know they're deceived. The Bible says that a woman, if she has long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given for her covering. The way a woman wears her hair is a sign of submission. One woman I know... Her husband said in front of her, I hate red hair. Now, for those of you who have red hair, you don't know this person, so cheer up. Don't worry about it. He was being outrageous. He, he was just being foolish. How does a woman have, you know, it's like you can't change your hair from gray or black. What about red to yellow or brown, you know? But he said, I hate red hair. About a month later, I was visiting this guy, and his wife had dyed his hair red, or her hair red, and, and wore it as red hair for the next 25 years, probably. She was one of the most commanding, self-willed women I think I've ever met. Now listen to what it says about Eve. Adam was, this is in 1 Timothy 2, Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was, listen, now listen, this is critical. You got to get this. You can't go by this scripture without recognizing it. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. One of the problems is if, if Adam was deceived, he has an excuse for his sin. But the Bible says he wasn't deceived. She was, but he wasn't. And the Bible makes something else very clear. Sin entered the world through Adam, not Eve, even though she ate the fruit first. How many of you knew that?
Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And so he attacks Eve. And he says, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? God, notice the way he turned that around. And I appreciate Pastor Aaron for sharing this some months ago. He said, has God indeed told you you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Isn't it amazing? God says you can eat freely of every tree, but not that one. So what does the devil do? Does God say you can't eat every tree? What a stupid woman to listen to that man or that evil spirit. And she says, oh no, we may eat of the free fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it. God did not say not to touch it. This is a better fruit. This looks like fruit. Neither shall you touch it. She saw it was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, tree desired to make one wise. I'll not die. No, you'll not surely die. God said, you'll surely die. No, I'll, you're not going to surely die. The moment she added to the words, I'm not going to die. No, you're not going to die. He said, don't eat it or touch it. Well, you won't die. Touch it. Go ahead. I didn't die. God never said she would. But she had come under the influence of an evil spirit. And like the Bible says that a woman needs to be careful because of the angels. And the first woman who functioned out from under the covering of her husband or of a man becomes deceived by the satanic kingdom. And she literally... Then it says she gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And then Adam and Eve begin to feel naked, and the reason they felt naked is because they felt, they, they for the first time in their existence, became self-centered. They had never been self-centered. They didn't even know they were naked. They were so consumed with love for the, uh, each other, they had no idea they were naked until they became self-centered through their sin. God says, who told you you were naked? <clears throat> she blames the devil. God didn't even correct her. And Adam said this, and I've read this, I think, wrong for years. I think I saw something this week in that scripture that I've never noticed. Here's how I usually read it. God, the woman you gave me, the one to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. I'd like to put different inflection on that. Father, the woman that you have given me to be with me, she gave me the tree, and I ate it. Do you see a difference in that? The woman just simply said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the New Testament confirms that was true. She was deceived. She admitted it right away, and then Paul confirms it was true. Listen to what Romans tells us in chapter 5. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. I made comment about this in the past. I throw it out for those of you who weren't here. It has been proven by science that every single man on the face of the earth descends from one man and one woman. Through DNA, they now know that's the truth. And if you reversed your life and your mother and dad life and your granddaddy's life and your great granddaddy's life and just kept reversing every life, we would all end up in the loins of Adam and Eve. You see, we were there. 
And that's why it said, sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. We were in the loins of Adam and I can't go into this, but read the book of Hebrews and study the thought of Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek and Levi getting the credit for it 400 years later because he was in the loins of Abraham. You study that out on your own. But it says that one man, not two, not Adam and Eve, and 1 Corinthians says this, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, not Adam and Eve, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Are you following me so far? I'm going to put this all together. I believe I am. In my mind, I am. Whether that's true in your mind when I'm all done is up to the miracle of grace. Romans 5.14, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. Listen to this phrase. And I have a suspicion almost nobody here has ever seen this. Who had not sinned according to the trans likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Adam was a type of Christ. In fact, Jesus is called the last Adam. He's not just the second Adam, because if there's a second Adam, it's, he's never called the second Adam. He's called the last Adam. People say he's the second Adam. Well, if he's the second, there might be a third or a fourth or a fifth. No, he's not the second Adam. He's the last Adam. And you have to understand that Jesus Christ, the Bible says, that the Father made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Now, I don't believe Adam fully understood what it meant when God said, you're going to surely die. How could he? He's never seen anything die. How would he know what it meant to die? Sure, he, meant, he knew it meant something serious. But when Eve ate from the tree, here's what I think happened. He said, whatever she's going to suffer, I'm going to suffer with her because I love her. And she was with him and gave him the fruit. And he said, Father, the woman you gave me to be with me, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. He made a choice, not out of evil. It was not an evil choice. It was a good choice in his perspective to be with his wife. And God says, you know, he's a type of me. How many of you know that God, the son, descended from heaven, became a man, grew up on this earth, suffered at the hands of the wicked, died on a cross and was buried and taken to the lower parts of the earth. And then one day the Lord raised him from the dead. He identified with us in our death. And he raised us together with him to be with him. And I believe that Adam loved his bride so much that he gave his life to be with her. How could he not love her that way? He was perfect. He was innocent. She had to be the most gorgeous woman and the most wonderful woman and the most, lo uh, and, and the most uh, godly thing you could have possibly com comprehended. And he loved her. And he was totally oblivious to his nakedness because he was so consumed with her. Wouldn't you ladies like to have a husband like that? I'd like to have a wife like that. Well, I'm not sure I'd like to have a wife. <laughs> I'm still not, I've not come to a conclusion on that one yet. But he sinned and became a sinner because he disobeyed what God said. But he disobeyed it because he wanted to be with his wife. I believe that's absolutely clear in Scripture. Scripture. 
And the moment he did this, it's interesting, God never addressed them at first. All he said was, I'm going to put enmity between Satan, he's speaking the devil, you and the woman, and between her seed and your seed. And that seed, speaking of Christ, is going to bruise your head. And I talked about it last week. He's going to, he's going to smash. He's going to smash. He's going to crush your head. And when he does, he's going to hit you so hard he'll bruise his heel. I saw a snake on the news yesterday. It was like six or seven foot long rattlesnake about this big crossing a golf path down south somewhere. They tell you down south, if you hit a ball in the rough, don't go looking for it. And I don't go. If I've only been down there once golfing, and I, de- I never looked for him because I knew what could be in that woods. I'll come back to this part of Adam for further explanation but by the time I get done. But Adam had a free will, and he made the choice to disobey God because of his great love for his wife. Now, Satan, he had a free will. But how many of you know that Satan... No, let me reword this. How many of you know that the angels of God have an eternal purpose in God's economy? The angels that are now in heaven, faithful to the Lord, are going to go forward into heaven forever. They have an eternal purpose, an eternal function. In fact, right now in heaven, the people that are there are joining with the angels, the 10,000s times 10,000s of angels that are worshiping, and it's got to be something that is absolutely beyond our ability to comprehend how glorious it is. And the angels in heaven are all there saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And you've taken your great power and you've reigned. They're worshiping and, and, and worshiping in such a fashion that you and I are limited to, to not even be able to do it like they do. But Satan had, when he was created, an eternal purpose. Now, the question is, let's look at Satan for a few minutes. When was Satan created? Now, I mentioned in Sunday school that there's different views about a former creation in the past and so forth. I don't believe in a pre-creation beyond this one. Because the Bible says in Genesis 1.1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And I shared with you this recently. Heavens cannot be referring to the stars and the planets because in the same chapter, just a few days later, God creates the sun, the moon, and the stars, and it was on the fourth day. Before the first day of creation, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created the heavens. They were created first. But the sun, the moon, and the stars were created on the fourth day. Therefore, If God created the heavens and the beginning of creation, I believe he created the angels and this globe before there were stars, a sun, and a moon. God created the heavens and the earth, the angelic and the terra firma. It's interesting what Job says in Job 38 He says to Job when he was correcting Job, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. How would you like to be talked to like that by God? Job had to be one unbelievable man. Or who stretched out the line upon it? To what were its foundations fashioned? Or who laid its cornerstone? Then he says this, When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Do you know what that verse is saying? That as God created the earth, the angels were singing and shouting as he did it. Because he said in the beginning God created the heavens. The first thing he created was the heavens. Have I lost you? I mean, this is pretty 
This is just standard Bible. You know, I, I'm convinced that if people read comic books the way they read the Bible, they wouldn't make any sense. I believe if you just read the Bible, you don't have to have a doctorate in theology to understand it. You read it and believe what it says. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens. And the sentence could have ended there with a period. But he said, God created the heavens and the earth. So the first thing he creates is the heavens. And then he tells us that as he began to create the earth, and he laid the foundations of it, that the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. That is a biblical, those are, bo are both biblical terms for the angels, sons of God and the morning stars. In fact, Satan's name was Lucifer, the bright morning, the morning star. And the angels were in existence before mankind. Mankind was created on the sixth day. And then God says, let's, let's make man in our own image according to our own likeness. And then he says something that is pretty amazing. He said, let them have dominion. And then he says, dominion over everything on the earth. Everything that lives and moves. And then there's a little insight about this creation in chapter 1, verse 31. Listen to this verse. Then God saw everything that he, in, he had made. Now, does that include everything? When God says, and God saw everything he had made, is there anything exempt from that everything, or does that mean everything? Right? And indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. The angelic beings were good at the end of the sixth day. In fact, they were very good. I am convinced from Scripture that Satan did not fall until after man was created and given dominion over the whole earth. Because at the end of creation, God says, I looked at everything I made, and it was all very good. For those of you who have believed and taught in a pre-creation like I used to, these verses caused me to realize, wait a minute, that doesn't hold up with Scripture. There was no pre-creation. -pre First thing God did was create the angels, then he creates the earth, and they rejoice as creating the earth. And after he's all done creating everything, he looks at it and says, <laughs> look what I made. That's really very good. What do you think of that, Lucifer? Isn't that good? And all of a sudden, Lucifer is looking at this little man. And we learn something about Lucifer in Ezekiel 28. Thankfully, I've got, I'm almost done. Well, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting down on my pages here. But, but I, I need to read something to you from the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 28. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord. Now the king of Tyre here, all, all Bible scholars, I think 100% agree that this is not talking about the natural king of Tyre. It is talking about Satan, and I'll show you why they believe that as we read it. Thus says the Lord, You were the seal of perfection. King of Tyre couldn't have been that full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Couldn't have been that. Now listen to this. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Couldn't be the king of Tyre. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, topaz, diamond, barrel, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and, timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Just make, take note of this. Satan was the first creature in whom music was created, and he is a master musician, and he is using music in this generation to destroy lives by the multiplied millions, including in the churches. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the stones. 
You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Lawlessness. Why would there be lawlessness? Iniquity was found. He wasn't created with iniquity. At the end of six days, he was very good. But all of a sudden, iniquity shows up. Lawlessness. By the abundance of your merchandise, you became filled with violence within, and you have sinned. Merchandise. If a judge merchandises his office, he uses his office to get something other than what he was supposed to get. Isn't that true? You became filled with violence within, and you have sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings. You defiled your sanctuary by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading or your merchandise. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst, and it devoured you. And I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. We get a little insight to the devil from the writings of Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 3. He says this, A bishop then must be blameless, speaking of a pastor, an overseer, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? And then Paul says this, not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation of the devil. How many of you have heard of or seen leadership, pastoral leaders? Often novices do this, but sometimes it's old guys as well. Maybe they were novices in the sense of novice in the ministry, but not novice in age. But they become lifted up with pride And they begin to believe they're above the law of God. And they begin to want something that they are not supposed to have. Very often, the thing that they want is some immoral act with some woman in their congregation. I've known some wonderful ministers who have fallen into this. They wanted something, they coveted something, and they weren't supposed to be covetous, but they coveted something that God had not ordained for them to have. And in the middle of this teaching, Paul says, not an novice, lest you fall into the same condemnation of the devil, unless you become guilty of the same thing he did. I believe Satan became Satan when God gave dominion over the whole earth to Adam, there was a jealousy, a covetousness. He wanted something God hadn't ordained him to have. And iniquity was found in him. It came out of him. He, he allowed that covetous spirit to control him. Listen to what Hebrew says. For under the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is, now listen to this, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you visitest him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of your hands, you have put all things in subjection under his feet. Made him lower than the angels means inferior to the angels. And yet God says, he put all things in subjection 
under man's feet. And so here's Satan, perfect in wisdom, perfect in beauty, gloriously covering the throne as the cherub then believes by, by commentators to be an archangel covering the throne with his glory, walking in the presence of God. And God creates this man. Hebrews was quoting from Psalm 8. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you made him a little lower than angels and have crowned him with glory and honor. You made him to have dominion over the works of your hands and put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the depths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Satan was there and he sees the creation and they're all singing, they're all happy, they're rejoicing, they're shouting for joy as this creation is being birthed in front of their eyes. And, at, and Satan is there and it's kind of like, oh, I'm perfect in wisdom and beauty. I'm going to rule over this. And then God creates man makes him lower. And then he says to this man, lower than the angels, I'm making you have dominion over everything. And at that moment, something happened in the heart of Lucifer. It's interesting what Hebrew says, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they, the angels, now listen to what they are. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? The word minister there is the Greek word diakona, diakonia, which means we get the word deacon. And the word means servants who execute or perform the commands of others. So God creates man, puts him in puts everything under his dominion and Satan is standing there and knowing the man's made lower than he is and then God says oh by the way you know what your job is going to be serve that man <laughs> that'd be like you being the most efficient person in your whole factory or, or company and somebody's promoted that is so far inferior to you, and then your boss says, you're their secretary. Not one of us would like that. But Satan says, oh, mm, I'm the one that's perfect in beauty. I'm the one that's perfect in wisdom. And hatred to mankind began to operate. Listen to what it says in Isaiah. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground? You have weakened the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. Listen to what he says. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Do you know who the stars of God are? Daniel says, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. We are the stars of God. And then he says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. <laughs> we heard about the congregation from our song leader this morning, didn't we? How many of you realize that all through Scripture, the Lord calls the church and his people the congregation. Then he goes on, he says, and on the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. How many of you know Hebrews tells us that the righteous are a cloud of witnesses? What was Satan saying? He was saying, I'm going to be above man. I'm going to be above the clouds. I'm going to be above the stars. I'm going to be above the congregation. Man is not going to receive my service. They're going to serve me. 
and he fell. And Lucifer became the devil and Satan, the liar and the murderer. He thought he should have dominion. And because of the way he did what he did, how many of you understand that the biblical teaching is he got the dominion? Listen to what Luke says. Then the devil, taking Jesus up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Jesus didn't correct it. He didn't say, Oh, Satan, no, it's not yours. No, Jesus was here, a man in the flesh, born of a woman, fully human, fully God. And Satan says, I have all authority over all the earth, and I'll give it to you if you'll just worship me. The problem was, Jesus was the first man since Adam who was not under his control. And so he attacks Jesus viciously after a 40, during a 40-day fast or afterward and tries to take his life and causing him to bow down and come under his dominion. And Jesus says, no, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. 2 Corinthians 4 calls Satan the God of this world. Ephesians 2 calls him the prince of the power of the air. And rulership over the earth was what Satan believed. He was given at creation. He thought he would have the dominion. And when Adam was given it, something happened in his heart. He failed the test. When Adam was given the dominion, Pride was allowed to enter. Now let's tie this all together. I'm going to say something that is going to shake you, if I haven't already. But I'm quoting one of the greatest theologians of the last hundred years. He said this. First of all, he pre preceded the statement that he was going to make with this. And this is clearly scripture. It is sin to call good evil and to call evil good. How many of you know the scripture that addresses that problem? Don't call sin good evil and evil good. Those are both wicked. But here's what this man said. Evil is not good, but it is good that there is evil. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the universe ruled by a good and perfect God. Does that make sense to you? One of the greatest church leaders in the entire centuries of the church said this, and I, you know, I didn't know these things until I studied this. I've made the statement a few weeks ago, and I said it in my own weak way. I said, because of my limitations, I, I, I don't know any other way to say this than to say God needed there to be sin and rebellion so he could reveal himself. How many of you realize if there hadn't been a rebellious Adam we would not know God is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, forgiving. There's humble. There's whole, whole aspects of the character of God. We would not know. So this man said, evil is not good, but it is good that there is evil. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the universe ruled by a good and perfect God. This other great theologian from centuries ago said, God has ordained that evil come into the world, or if he had not ordained it, it wouldn't be here.
Evil has no power to overcome the sovereign rule of this universe. God has his own purpose for allowing evil in the world. How many of you know what is the favorite Bible verse year after year among Christians? Does anybody know? No, that's their favorite witnessing verse. Huh? No. What's one of the most comforting scriptures to you in all the Bible? Just answer that to you out of your, your heart. That's a good one. There we got it. Who said that? Thank you. The favorite verse of the Christian community year after year is all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Do you realize unless God has sovereign power over evil, he will not be able to keep that promise? Am I stretching your mind a little bit today? I think I am because it stretched mine to get all this. I was up till almost 2 o'clock this morning reviewing all of this, and then I was back up at 7 reviewing it again to make sure I knew what I was going to say. God doesn't call all things good, but he does have the power to work all things for good. And if he doesn't have sovereign power, dominion, and authority over evil, he can't fulfill Romans 8.28. He can't make all things work together for good for those of us who love him. God has decided to allow evil into this world because of our necessity to be tested for his eternal purposes. You see, in the new heaven and the new earth, which we're going to look at next week, the Lord willing, if I'm still alive and well, and the Lord doesn't change my mind, we're going to look at the new heavens and the new earth. And you know one of the things that's not there? There's no evil of any kind. There's no sorrow, pain, suffering, wickedness of any kind. He's ultimately going to remove evil. I started out saying, where did evil come from? I'm, I'm having a very, I'm being taxed to try to show you where evil came from. But I'm not taxed to tell you this. I know where it's going to end. God has decided to allow evil in this world because of our necessity to be tested so that when we get into the new heavens and we get into the new earth, there will never be another backslider. There'll never be another Judas. There'll never be another Adam. Think of Joseph. He says to his brothers after they were all exposed to who he was, and now they're looking at the, what do they call him? He wasn't the Pharaoh, but he was the, like the vice Pharaoh. And they were real concerned that he might do something really bad to them now that the old man had died. And he looks at him and he says this, but, you know, and he looks at him and he says, basically, you know what you did, and you know why you did it, and I know why you did it. And he looks at him and he says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. God took the evil actions of those brothers and said, I'm in charge of evil. And if there wasn't, if, if God didn't need or did God didn't ordain or God didn't want or evil wasn't necessary, God in his almighty providence and sovereignty and his almighty power would have never allowed it to be here. And when we face evil, we have to say, Lord, what good do you want to work in me? Think of the crucifixion. 
That was the most evil act ever committed in the history of the human race. Jesus is the perfect man, never committed a single error, went about doing good his whole life, openly established beyond any possible doubt that he was the Son of God, confirmed by John the Baptist in chapter 1 of John that he was the Son of God. And yet this most evil act committed by Caiaphas, Annas, the Sanhedrin, Pilate, Herod, the Roman soldiers has been set aside when he was crucified. That day has been set aside, mistakenly, by the way, and called Good Friday. The best thing that ever happened on the earth was the result of the most wicked act ever committed on the earth. Do you see this? Now, were those men guiltless? No, they were guilty. They were vicious. They were wicked. And I presume most, if not every single one of them, except maybe the soldier that said this man was surely the son of God, are probably in hell today. But the biggest and greatest event in the history of the world was the cross committed by evil men, and we call it Good Friday. We should be calling it Good Wednesday, but it's, they call it Good Friday. I don't want to blow away your traditions, but that's just simply the facts. If you study the Bible and believe what the Bible says. The question we have to ask is this, who ultimately delivered Jesus to Calvary? One thing we know is he said, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down. But here's what Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 53. It pleased the Lord, speaking of his father, to bruise him, and he has put him to grief. God the Father crucified Jesus the Son. That's who did it. Now, did he use Caiaphas and Annas and Herod and Pilate? Yes. But it was God the Father who decided to give the best gift the world has ever been given by using evil to do it. I've been betrayed in my life by men that I trusted with my life. There are men that I have walked with that I literally trusted with my life. I told them that. And within months, they completely and totally betrayed me. Think of Judas. We're going to look at him in Sunday school next week. But how many of you remember Judas was picked by Jesus knowing he was a devil? Why? Because he needed a betrayer. Do you understand when I say God needed evil? Evil was necessary. And if it wasn't, God would have never allowed it in his universe with his sovereign power. And here's the other fact. Before God created the world, the covenant, as we saw a few weeks ago, of the redemption was already made in heaven in eternity past. Amen. He knew it was going to happen, and he's all powerful. He could have said, oh, no, 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 kill that loser. Throw him in hell right now. He said, no, let, let, him, let him run his course. Let evil do its work, and when it's done, I'm going to have a people conformed to my image, because that's what Romans 8, 28 is all about. For God, the Bible, for all things work together for good to those who are the called according to his purpose. And the next verse is, because he wants to conform us to his image. When you face evil, it is God choosing to allow you to be changed into his image. That's what he uses it for. 
like Joseph. Do you think Joseph would have been Joseph if he had not been sold into Potiphar's house and his evil wife had not seduced him and lied about him and put him in the jail and then left there for two more years? You know, he was in the jail baking. He was getting ready for the throne. Do you think after he told those guys their dream and they went up, he spent two more years suffering in that prison, being faithful the whole time? And finally, the cupbearer says, oh, by the way, Pharaoh, you know, you had a dream. And I know somebody can interpret dreams. And I remember, I remember my evil deeds. And I remember the mess that I was in. But there's a guy, there's a Hebrew guy down there that can really give you some answers. And he goes from the dungeon to the second most powerful man in the world in one short few hours. But why? Because he had been prepared by his evil brothers, by his evil uh, Potiphar. And Potiphar was evil because I'm convinced he knew Joseph was guiltless. You know how I know that? Potiphar was the head of the prison. Did you know that? Potter was the captain of the guard. And the captain of the guard, the Bible says, was the head of the prison. So if you had a man who you felt tried to seduce your wife and you threw him into prison, would you make him the head of the prison? No, you'd put him in the most dingy, dungy, darkest, terrible spot in the whole place. But Potter says, yeah, I, I know this guy. He didn't do that. My wife's a liar and a slut. Well, that's what, that's what I'm trying to say. I mean, <laughs> I'm just, I'm sorry. I mean, the way some of you were looking and laughing, it's like, how else do you say that? And he says, no, no. Put him in charge of the whole prison. It'll be blessed. So Potiphar was evil for standing with his wife instead of with Joseph. And he just keeps getting prepared, getting prepared. And it was 13 years from the time his brother sold him till he became the head of Pharaoh's whole nation. And when he walked out, he could say to his brothers instead of, you dirty, filthy, deceitful, lying group of bums, he could look at himself, oh, you meant it for evil. We both know that. But he fell on his, their necks and kissed them. Kissed the very evil people who made him who he was. When the relativists said there is no good or evil, they got a problem because there's so much good, it exposes the evil, and the evil exposes the good. The two of them literally expose each other. And there's coming a day when the Lord will be able to separate all of us from evil for the last time. Aren't you glad? What I've just shared with you is probably some of the most difficult theology to explain and I don't know whether I've done a good job or not, but I've explained it to the best of my ability, which is obviously limited. But I am convinced that we need to just look at evil as a servant to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. And if we don't do that, brothers and sisters, you know what I believe about the end times, and you know what the book of Revelation teaches about the end times. If we don't see that God is in total control of evil, we are going to be shaken to the core of our beings in the days ahead. But if we know, oh, if God didn't ordain this, it wouldn't be happening. If God didn't decide to raise up this Antichrist, he wouldn't be there. If God didn't decide to raise up this false prophet who will be called Jesus, it wouldn't have happened. God's in control. And one of the most glorious scriptures we'll see in the book of Revelation class, and I end with this, is when God is ready to show John all the truths of the last days, he shows him his throne 
and in front of his throne is a sea of glass. You know what that shows? In heaven, everything is calm. John, I'm going to show you earth-shaking things, but know this. Here with me and in heaven, everything's calm. Everything's under control, and I'm in charge. Just relax. Amen. Amen. Let's stand this morning. Father, you are wonderful. You are perfect in every way. You are perfect in wisdom and truth. You are omnipotent in power. You are wise in every fashion. And the fact that you allowed evil to enter this creation was not some accident. It was not some force out of your control. Lucifer wasn't able to do it and surprise you. You, oh God, were in charge. And for whatever reason, you ordained it. And I hope that today I've caused this congregation to understand that you allow evil for our good. And I pray that you will cause us to embrace you, to trust you, to hope in you in the face of every single thing we ever face. In Jesus' name.